Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The book of Jonah is at once hilariously funny and incredibly serious, but we miss the good stuff if we try to take it literally. Jonah is part of the prophetic canon, but it's not history, and it's not even prophecy. It's actually a satire. It's a comedic spoof on the prophet himself. Christians through the centuries have spent an embarrassing amount of energy trying to figure out how exactly the whale swallowed Jonah. Was it a whale or was it a fish? And how did he stay alive three days in the belly of the beast? But I think we will learn much more from Jonah and even come to really enjoy his story if we read it for what it's meant to be, a parable. A parable about the economy of God's grace. Jonah is a parable about God's grace for outsiders. The word of the Lord comes to Jonah, a prophet of Israel, and says, Jonah, go preach to Nineveh. The Assyrians, the conquerors, the bad guys. In every other prophetic book in the Bible, the prophet gets right up and does what God says. But Jonah makes a beeline in the opposite direction. He jumps on a boat to Tarshish. And Tarshish is not just the wrong way, it is way too far away. If Jonah lived in Taos, it would be as if God called Jonah to go to Farmington, and instead Jonah hopped on the first plane to Florida. But there is no hiding from or escaping the Lord. God tracks down Jonah at sea and sends a great storm. The storm batters the ship, and Jonah says, It's me, quoting Taylor Swift, throw me overboard. But God tracks down Jonah in the sea and sends a great fish to swallow him up. Three days Jonah spins in the belly of the whale. But when Jonah cries out to God, God saves him. And like all good comics, here the author engages in a little scatological humor. God's grace comes to Jonah in the form of projectile fish vomit. <laughs> so God speaks to Jonah again. Same message, go preach to Nineveh. This time, Jonah at least has the good sense to do what he's told. But he phones it in. He slinks into the Nineveh suburbs, doesn't even make it halfway into the city, and proceeds to give the world's worst sermon. Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. But lo and behold, the world's worst and shortest sermon is also the world's most effective. The people of Nineveh listen. They put on sackcloth and ashes and they repent. Jonah, it turns out, is the only universally successful prophet in the entire Bible. God sees the Ninevites' repentance and God changes God's mind. God does not destroy Nineveh. And how does our boy Jonah feel about his crowning moment? He hates it. He sulks out of the city and plops himself down on a hill to pout. God comes to him and says, Jonah, what's the matter? And Jonah says, you saved the bad guy. That's why I didn't want this gig in the first place. I knew you were gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. I knew you'd forgive those Ninevites. And now Jonah says, I want to die. For to quote the poet Thomas Reese, it is better for me to die than to see my enemy live. The message of this parable would have been obvious to Jonah's first readers. 
The book was written at a time when the Hebrew people had become very insular, very self-focused and exclusive. One could call them xenophobic, even. The powers that be in the nation were hostile to anyone outside of their tribe. So the author of the book of Jonah, the real prophet in this story, writes this satire and says, guys, knock it off. Stop being a bunch of bigots. You sound like Jonah pouting up on the hill. Don't you see that God's grace is bigger than just our people? Jonah is a parable about God's grace for outsiders. It's a funny story. High comedy. But it's also a sobering story because Jonah is also a parable about God's grace for our enemies. God could have sent Jonah to any foreign city and made the point about outsiders. But God sends Jonah to Nineveh. Let's back up a little, get some history. In the Old Testament, after the reigns of King David and King Solomon, there's a civil war in Israel and the kingdom splits in two. The nation of Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Divided, the 12 tw tribes of Israel are weaker. And conquering nations around them begin to look at them with renewed interest. Especially this rising superpower in the east, known as the Assyrian Empire. Israel is at war off and on throughout the whole story with surrounding nations. And they're scared. They see that this empire, Assyria, is much stronger than they are. So they ask Assyria for help defeating another enemy. And Assyria does help Israel for a bit. And then they invade them. And they conquer them. And destroy their cities and carry their people off into captivity. The Assyrians are traitors. They're the conquerors. They're evildoers. They're the mortal enemies of the Hebrew people. And what city do you think is the capital of the Assyrian Empire? That's right, Nineveh. So the parable of Jonah is set before all that happens, right? Before the Assyrians conquer Israel. But of course it was written long ago after these events take place. Which means that for its first readers, the book of Jonah is not just a satire, it's a work of historical fiction. It would be like if we picked up a book set in Germany in 1932, or in New York City on September 10th, 2001. We know what's about to happen and we know how things will end. The people of Nineveh did not repent and change their ways. Jonah is sent to announce forgiveness to the nation who will one day conquer and destroy his people. We hear those words of Jesus, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, and it sounds all well and good, except, except the thing about enemies is that they can cause real harm. Not all enmity is the result of mere prejudice or short-sightedness. Sometimes there is real evil at work. Sometimes our enemies do damage to us. Sometimes we are hurt by one another in ways that leave tangible scars. I wonder, is there someone 
or some theme that has caused you this kind of harm. Someone who's hurt you physically, emotionally, spiritually. Who or what has left scars on you the way Nineveh and her people left scars on Jonah? And what are we to do with this teaching that God's grace extends to our enemies? To the very ones who harmed us. Now, hear what I'm saying. There's nuance to this. Nineveh has done wrong, and Nineveh will pay for it. The Hebrew Bible is full of prophets calling Nineveh to task, condemning their violent actions prophesying God's judgment upon the city. And history tells us, in its due time, Nineveh too is destroyed. God's grace is not exemption from consequence. The theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, German in World War II, is famous for saying that grace without accountability, grace without repentance, grace without justice is cheap grace, which is no grace at all. God does not call us to be doormats in the face of our enemies. Actions have consequences in heaven and on earth. But God does call us to forgive. This is a parable about God's grace for our enemies. But Jonah is also a parable about God's grace for us. At the end of the story, it's just God and Jonah sitting on a hill debating God's mercy. Jonah is petulant and childish, laughably so, he keeps proclaiming how he's angry enough to die. But God does not leave him. God does not end the relationship. In this great parable of God's grace, there's room and grace for Jonah as well. One of you reminded me this week about Richard Rohr's teachings on the economy of grace. We live in a world of competition, Rohr says, of dualism, of either-or, winners and losers. But God's grace refuses to settle for anything less than win. Win. Compassion for us. Compassion for our enemies. If this doesn't make sense to you, it's because it doesn't make sense. God's grace operates on a totally different playing field than anything else we know. Is there a world in which both we and our enemies end up okay? Is it right that this is the world God desires? The story of Jonah ends with a question, a question that Jonah does not answer. God asks, should I not have compassion for Nineveh just as I have compassion for you? Jonah doesn't answer, but we can. Friends, can we? Will we make room in our hearts and our worldviews, in our holy imaginations, for a God of utter grace? Or will we, like Jonah, sit on the hill and pout?